Tonight, what we're going to do um, is we're going to dissect a sutta, similar, kind of similar to what we did last time. We, I sent you uh, what it, the, the commentary, and I think we can, this is shorter than the other one, but the way I'll take you through this one is I will take you through the, um, through it, and then if you decide you want to, um, well, you, I walk you through it and then explain it to you as we're going along. Um, then if you want to go back and listen to part of it again, uh, but shortening it a little, I'll do it again for you so you can listen. Because the most important thing with this sutta, um, for me, it's a very, very close to my heart. And why is because essentially the Madhupandika Sutta is explaining clearly when they make war and when they make peace. So for me, this is ringing bells. This is, if they would only understand, I have a thing about uh, peace, making peace in peace conferences and things. As children, my children grew up seeing people go in buildings and saying, oh, look, they're all going in to make peace. And they, I'll take a big picture. Did you ever notice that? And then they all go in the building. We don't hear anything about what they're doing in there. As a mother, I can tell you now, <laughs> okay? But when they come out, they take another picture and they all say goodbye. And then later we hear about some little thing or it sounds big, but it never gets passed or something like that. It's a tragedy for humanity that we can't seem to get beyond our habitual tendencies and our jealousies and our just all out greed. It is a tragedy when we say we're at the top of the food chain uh, in, in the animal kingdom as the top, the top of the heap. And yet we forget that we are stewards for the animals and stewards for the earth and we have forgotten it, the relationship. And so we build these cities and everything and then we forget all this. But my argument in looking at this sutta, whenever I hear it, what goes off for me in my head is if they could only learn or have a conference about war and learn how war actually happens before and make sure everybody takes the quiz and they pass it, <laughs> you know, then they could have a meeting about peace and they would have something to talk about because they know how war happens. But the people that sit down and talk about peace are not ready to talk about peace because they don't seem to understand human nature universally on the globe and what is happening when people go to war. So when I hear this sutta, I always go to this one spot. So I wanna get started. Um, Let's see, we go back to the green board and we open up this one. <clears throat> now, SK notes, uh, if you've never heard of them, I've been doing this for 20 years and the fifth year I started writing SK notes. And I had a brain injury from an accident, so it's very hard for me to take everything and keep it and compute it. So I'm the one that sits in the back of the room when Bonte gives talks. Uh, with a desk writing constantly and taking these notes and then I expand them and then they turn into things like this. And there's actually about 40 of these that are mostly uh, not, maybe not as honed as nicely as this one. So this is coming from a talk. This is a talk that Bonte gives and he uses it to teach dependent origination. But we're going to look at it, you can think about it that way, and you'll see part of that happen, but I want you to think about the war and peace angle of it, too. Uh, and this talk he gives very often when he goes in public or uh, sometimes in retreats. And it was June 16th of 2014 he did it this time. You see we have his whole name, almost his whole name is there this time. It's very funny. Somebody put this on there and I left it on there. The most venerable Syed Ajib uh, Bhanti Vimala Ramsey Maha Tara. <laughs> That's the, pretty much the whole name. The reason this is, I'm sounding funny about this is because in the United States, these names mean nothing. Titles mean nothing. You have to remember that to Americans, we are the ones who sent the king back to England. 
And ever since that happened in the Revolutionary War, they don't take kindly to these kinds of titles and stuff. So we don't have a lot of them. Now the Pali name for this sutta is the Madhu Pandika Sutta. And I told you, uh, for me, the real sweetness is like Venerable Ananda comments on at the very end. And it speaks to me of the solution and understanding about how war or peace happens. The very end of the sutta, you'll hear a statement. It has been taught many, many times in the past 20 years in retreats and at DSMC and around the world. And frankly, I didn't expect to find a solution for a modern challenge that faces each and every one of us in our day-to-day -day work and also within our entire world. So the solution I'm talking about as we go through it, you'll figure it out. It relates to you in lockdown. It relates to you in work. It relates to you if you're involved in innovation and invention. It relates to you if you are in upper class or lower class jobs working in a field, you know, uh, in the immigrant population. It, it just relates to everybody. The challenge I'm speaking of is the challenge of a wandering mind. How much productivity is lost uh, to this kind of mind? You know, you wonder about that, but the answer is given here. And it is clear that this sutta explains exactly how this problem arises and how it can be solved. When you become more attuned to the teaching itself, You'll, you'll decide not to just turn on a sutta and listen to it one time. You'll find a sutta that you really value and you listen to it over and over and over and over again. And when that starts to happen, um, such as this sutta, if you listen closely, you're going to discover more significant things inside of the sutta text that help you and me become happier and at whatever we're doing in life because it keeps adding to the information in the brain of what you're doing with the brahma viharas now if you didn't if you haven't heard what the brahma viharas are so neat about the brahma viharas are coming up and as they appear something else is being canceled out and that has nothing to do with breathing meditation it doesn't happen naturally and what I'm talking about is when you're practicing your loving kindness, there's no thoughts of ill will that can come up in your mind. And when you are continually practicing karuna, the compassion, no thoughts of cruelty can come up in your mind. In your relationships to your dog, to your cat, to other people, anything, it just can't come up. When you're working with mudita, which is an empathetic form of joy, they say altruistic, I say you're feeling happier than you ever have for the guy down the street because he got his job. Has nothing to do with you. It's not a personal thing, but you're really happy. When you experience that, you can have no discontent in your mind. And the last one is equanimity. The more firm the equanimity gets, the less aversion you have to anything. It cancels out aversion, thoughts of aversion coming up and pushing through. Now, I know people are still here, even in this group, who sit and think, when I'm in meditation, this is meditation, then I go to work. Uh, this is not what we're doing here. My talks, I want them always to be bearing down on the fact, can you use what I'm telling you in life? And this suit is real good for that. Now, even Q, he's my old friend, the questioner, has shown up to ask some questions along the way to help me write this particular commentary. You'll see he's in there, not a whole lot, but he is. Um, and we'll look a little deeper into the subject as it's addressed in the sutta. And it's nice to hear also what you think of the sutta after you listen to it and then, and we, as we read it through. And Q says, well, he starts out, what does this sutta tell us that the recluse Gotama asserts? when he teaches. Well, first of all, this commentary starts in section four. It doesn't start at the very beginning. So the first thing that happens here is that the Buddha is, the, is in the great wood at Kapilavatu where he lives. And he's in Negrotus Park. It's a section of the area. And it was in the morning after the alms round there while sitting under a bilva tree that he met uh, 
a recluse, you know, another um, recluse that was, his name was Don Dupani, who greeted him, but then he stood beside him after he greeted him properly and leaning rudely upon his stick, it's very rude to do that with a teacher, he started to ask a question and he asked the Buddha in, in the last line of section three in the sutta, what does the recluse Gotama assert? What does he proclaim? Okay, so now we know what we're gonna get in this. What does he proclaim? And you think, wow, he's gonna put a lot in this, but watch what happens. Then we hear the teaching begin for the main content in this sutta in section four. And the Buddha says to Dandapani, friend, I assert and proclaim my teaching in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, its brahmas, in this generation, with its recluses and its brahmins, its princes, and its people, in such a way that per perceptions no more underlie that person who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, remains free, worry-free, and is free from craving for any kind of being. Now, if we look at this and we take a look at just what I just said, he's detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, without confusion. He knows why he's not immensely involved in these sensual pleasures. So I'm asking you to look at this not just from the point of view of the extreme, like you're a monastic and you're going to go to reach Nirvana and completely go toward Arashatship. I'm also asking you to remember something. There's a lot that happens between the time you start your meditation practice until that level comes along. And in between, you can practice these things at all different levels. So keep it in mind, this is applying to you also. It's one of the ones that you can say most of the sutta is applying to both lay people and monks, but you have to use your common sense. If you're a lay person, you don't try to live by the kati mocha in your house or the vinaya, okay? You live by five precepts. And so you don't, my favorite example is someone who decided in a row house of condominiums, he was going to live like a monk, so he didn't cut his grass anymore or take care of his garden or his path to the door. But the whole place was gorgeous except for his place. It looked like nobody lived there. It must be for rent or for sale. It was just a mess. Well, that's because he said, well, I can't cut the grass. Well, wait a second. You're not a monk. You're a lay person, and you don't abandon your family and lock yourself in a room and just sit all day and you don't decide you're not gonna collect the beans when they come ripe in the vegetable garden. You can't pick them, you can only point to them. So if nobody can come and pick them, we can't go get the beans or dig the carrots or get the potatoes. These things are eccentric. So we have to get things and keep balance in our mind. So essential pleasures without perplexity means without being confused, all right, remains worry-free. He's not worried all the time about the future. Oh, what might happen, what might happen? And he's free from craving for any kind of being. And being has um, two meanings. Being is craving for the next life in the extreme, but also being, we translate this, this is like the bawa piece, okay? And we say, this is habitual, your habitual uh, reactions live there in that, in that link. So you're craving, you're not craving for any kind of reactions. When people say something to you, you're just gonna say, mm-hmm, uh-huh, whether you believe it or not. You're gonna just say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Remember, everybody wants to be agreed with and everybody wants to be loved. So agree with them and love them. Can't hurt you because in Nietzsche, five minutes later, you're on your own and they're gone the other way. So why cause a big, you know, problem? That's the way this is. So the, then the questioner, he says, the questioner in this sutta asked the Buddha, how do you assert and proclaim such a teaching as this? 
the Buddha then explains. Now, these are what you can write down. If you got this paper, you should take, that's why I put it like this so you could see all of them. The students are taught to go to the source to learn how perceptions and notions born of proliferation beset a man give a man trouble is what that means to beset a man means to give the man trouble in his mind if nothing is found there to delight in welcome and hold on to this is the end of the underlying tendency of lust so this is the first one is lust it's the end of the underlying tendency to aversion the underlying tendency to views to, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency conceit, the underlying tendency to desire for being. Now, when in meditation, uh, in this examination, we're considering meaning desire for reaction. You had this thing where you had to react to what everybody says at work when you go to lunch. Stop it. <laughs> Just sit there and smile and bite your and say yes to everybody and see how lunch goes. See how your stomach feels. <laughs> it's much better. <laughs> okay. And then the underlying tendency to ignorance. Okay. So when you look at these, what you're seeing is you have, um, you know, attachment, avert, attachment is the lust, aversion. You got views, your personal views, your personal ideas. Everything has to be your way, my way, or the highway. See, and you, you're letting go of this. You're, you're just being there and doubt. You, you doubt this, you doubt that. You have to contradict it. The tendency to do that. The conceit, I am right. Everybody else is wrong. Desire for the being is desire for the reaction um, all the time. And being the most important, the conceit thing. And being the top dog and then treating everybody else badly when you are. Which is unfortunate because you won't be top dog very long. <laughs> Always remember that about top dog, okay? Uh, the end of resorting, now this is the best part. This is the end, the way he's teaching is the end of resorting to rods and weapons and of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here these evil unwholesome states will cease without remainder. That's the total program, but doesn't mean that you can't vastly reduce this in your life and have a very much nicer life if you reduce it. So then the monks did not question the Buddha. Here's what happened. The monks did not question the Buddha any further. So the Buddha got up and he went to bed. He went into his, um, into his hut or his kuti, and the monks did not know what to do because they did not understand this simple statement. And that's all it said was one paragraph, the sum total of what he was teaching. So then one of them suggested they go find the Venerable Kachana. There's these two monks, Kohita and Kachana, Venerable Kachana and Venerable uh, Maha uh, Kachana. And um, the, the they're very very well versed in everything the buddha ever taught and ask him let's go find him and ask him to explain because they agreed and they all went as a group to find him and the next thing i have is kind of funny because the first thing the senior monk did was he reprimanded these monks uh, for not asking the question they had directly to the buddha fast enough uh, who uh, was just with them and he told them, this is a big lesson for all of you. You know, when we're here and we're on the Zoom, ask us the questions. When you go home, write the questions down, bring them in and ask them. He told them always ask the question when the master teacher is present. Don't take it home and brood over it and have it floating around inside your head during your meditation and bothering you. Don't do that. And then Mahakachana decided to expound on the statements. And he starts out, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of proliferation beset a man. We keep hearing this line over and over again. If nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold on to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust. 
of the underlying tendency to aversion, the underlying tendency to views, the underlying tendency to doubt, the underlying tendency uh, to conceit of the underlying tendency to desire for being, quick reactions, okay, of the underlying tendency um, to uh, ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, to quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here these evil unwholesome states will cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this uh, to be as follows. So here, Venerable Kachana repeated the, res the result of training to give up all underlying tendencies to them. Now we jump over to 16, because this I, what I took out of here was the way he reprimanded the monks. I didn't want to keep that. I just wanted to keep the meat of the, uh, the meat. Because, you know, we all know what it's like to be scolded by the, the elder. <laughs> okay. Okay, and now we go through, and this is what's important. When you have the book and you just have dots in it, don't cheat yourself. Either sit there and type it out or tell me which one of the sutras you want to use, and we probably have it on file where the whole sutta has been reconstituted. Why do I want you to hear the lesson six times in a row? Because I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go through this, all right? So you can relax and close your eyes and I'll go through it. Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about, what one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. We're gonna define all this as we go along. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source of the problem, okay? Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or a woman with respect to their past, their future, and present forms that are cognizable through the eye. So you did it with the eye. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. Means, makes it grow, you know? What, with what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or woman with respect to their past, their future, and their present forms cognizable by the ear, through the ear. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. With what one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. And what one craves, that one thinks about. And what one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. And with what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or woman with respect to their past, their future, and present forms cognizable through the nose. It's interesting, it's supposed to be odors through the nose, so I oopsed it when I typed it, sorry. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. 
with what one feels that one per perceives what one perceives that one craves what one craves that one thinks about what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as the source perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or woman with respect to their past their future and present forms cognizable through the tongue there we go flavors cognizable through the tongue help me may we got to rewrite this one <laughs> just a little oops is there dependent on the body and tangibles body consciousness arises the meeting of the three is contact with contact as condition there is feeling what one feels that one perceives what one perceives that one craves what one craves that one thinks about what one creates with what one has naturally proliferated, mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man in respect to the past, their future and present sensations cognizable through the body. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, which are thoughts, Mind consciousness arises. The meeting of these three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as the source perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or woman with respect to their past their future and present thoughts cognizable through the mind when there is an i a form an i consciousness it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. Now, this point is extremely important because this statement is agreeing with the idea that you can learn to detect the symptom of arising craving and clinging if you are practicing a meditation that assists you to observe properly by carefully watching and you understand how contact operates. Contact is always the sense door plus the sense door object plus the sense door consciousness. So the I and forms and I consciousness, then I can have contact. The ear sounds, ear consciousness, then I can have contact with the ear. The nose, odors, and nose consciousness. The tongue, the flavor, and the tongue consciousness. The body, sensation, and the body consciousness. See how it's working? Those three pieces are what formulate, like a formula, contact for it to happen. What is exciting is that the symptom is as important as if you have a broken engine of some kind and suddenly you see how it is broken. Like if you're working on a car and you just can't figure it out and all of a sudden you see it's a distributor cap or there's something wrong with just one or two pieces in the engine. If you know how it is broken, then there is a chance that you can fix it. The Buddha taught us an escape. From this problem of suffering, when he gave us right effort. That's what we were missing. The sixth, seventh, and eighth fold of the Eightfold Path. If we change the, what they mean, we don't define them quite right. It doesn't make sense anymore that they could have 
this practice within those three parts. If we understand right effort, then all of a sudden we've discovered the part that made it so nothing worked. Mm -hmm. Right effort, and we, he encouraged us to use this right effort all the time in life. Not just for sitting in meditation, all the time in life. He knew that we would be able to learn to see the symptom of a rising craving once we knew very well how the line of human cognition works. In the following, uh, you define the word manifestation is an event or action or object that clearly shows or embodies something abstract or theoretical is happening, manifestation. The manifestation, something happens and then something is manifesting. The first obvious manifestations, the first signs of global warming are the example. In our case, it's the first signs of a rising craving. The change in the tension and tightness in the body, and that includes the mind is the first place you see it, but you can sense it happening in the mind or the hands or anywhere in the body. Suddenly you, you sense this change. That's where your mind is trained to pick up. That's the cue for the six R's, for the mind to just do it and you don't think about doing it anymore. So can you see a manifestation? Yes, a manifestation is a sign. It's, and in this case, uh, you can learn to identify the sign, the manifestation of this contact when it's happening, okay? Um, okay, back to the sutta, when there is a, a manifestation, okay, here we go. When there is a manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When even feeling is coming, you can get that good. The first thing you start looking for when you're training is the arising of the, um, the ignition of the craving, the rising of the tension, like almost like you're gonna, you're gonna um, you know, you squeeze, uh, what do you say, a, um, a lighter to light the stove, I have to push the button. So there's tension in my finger. And when I click that button and light the stove, I'm lighting craving, see? But I have to do this first. I have to tense my finger and put it on that and push it and make the flame come. And that's one of the steps that's happening from feeling into craving, you see? So here he takes you, you can point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of perception of what it is that you are perceiving. We're going to, going to define these in the next piece. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving very clearly. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking when there is the manifestation of thinking, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perception and notions born of mental proliferation. Okay, now this next one, I was after I finished, I didn't have time, but one of the things I want to do with this is take the uh, what I'm doing in this next paragraph and put it up into the first paragraph. Maybe, may, maybe you can help me to do that, okay? The one we just read. Here we go. When there is an ear, a sound, and ear consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact because those three pieces are there. When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. Now, per, this signals, perceiving per, signals that perceiving something was occurring, naming something. This is Sanya. This is one of your, this is one of your aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Perceiving means to name something. You have to have that ability to experience. The, the aggregates are set up as the parts of the being. They're also set up as what is vital to have in order to experience the experience, to go through the experience. So you have the body, 
you have feeling, you have perception that happens, you have um, thoughts that arise. After you, I name it, you start thinking about it, and then you have um, consciousness. And these pieces, you're consciously aware of it. And that's how you're experiencing your, your life experience. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. Tanha is the craving and signs of desire or aversion are happening in this. It is when the atta comes up, the I like it or I don't like it mind. That's what your craving is. Now, when there is the manifestation of craving, whence you feel yourself, I, 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 happening, okay, the opinion and everything, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. Now, this thinking piece, signs or thinking, uh, this one is thoughts, and this is vitaka occurring. There are two pieces you'll, you'll, if you do get involved in concept and reality, you're going to see this vitaka, vichara, and then papancha. And vitaka is like this, the, the, um, the thought comes up, there's the thought, okay? And then when you're thinking, that's when you're analyzing. So the vitaka was like, there's the thought, and the vichara was the beginning to thinking about the thought. And then the ongoing thing uh, becomes what's here at the bottom, I'll show you. When there is manifestation of thinking uh, or clinging is going on, possible to point out the besetment of perceptions and notions, detecting the beginnings of the personal opinions and ideas. Perception is the, uh, the perceiving that something's going on in your mind and the notions are ideas that are woven into this and you keep going, it keeps going and going. Born of means caused by mental proliferation and mental proliferation means runaway thinking. And the term you'll find in uh, the book he's talking about is uh, Papancha Sanya Sankara, okay? Papancha is the runaway mind and the sanya is perceiving thoughts with the, with the runaway, the tumbling mind. It just goes and goes and goes. And this is bothering some people, you know, and, and um, the thing is part of growing up thinking that when your mind starts operating, you don't have any control over it. That's just not true. You do. You are steering the boat. You don't disappear. Don't get the self and no self and think you should have no self and come to me and say, well, there's nobody in here. I'm just supposed to sit here and just let everything happen. Well, good luck. <laughs> That's about as valuable as if I put you in the boat and say, you should be an island unto yourself. So I'm going to shove the boat off and send you over to live on the island. We'll come back and get you in five years. But I'm not going to give you any instructions before you go to the island. So do you think you're going to be any better when you come back off the island? No, because you didn't go over and get the instructions first and from the teacher and then go to the island be by yourself. That's a little different, okay. So when there is a nose, an odor, nose consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is a manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. And when there is the manifestation of thinking, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is a tongue, a flavor, and tongue consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. And when there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. 
when there is the manifestation of feeling, it's possible for you to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it's possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it's possible. It becomes possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. And when there is the manifestation of thinking, it, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. So one of the things he's definitely telling you over and over again here, you know, I'm telling you when I train you, it is possible for you to detect these things. You get it? That's what he's saying in each one of these paragraphs. It is possible for you to point out these things in your practice. That's what he's teaching them. And when there is a body, a tangible and a body consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is a manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. And when there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perceptions and notions that are born of mental proliferation. And when there is a mind, a mind object, and mind consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. And when there is the manifestation of craving, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. And when there is the manifestation of thinking, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Now within this sutta, do you see the use of the links of dependent origination being used? I don't know how many of you uh, were, um, have already been working with it, but the ones who have, can you see where contact is fasa, and that's one of the links, where feeling is vedana, pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. Can you see where perception is perceiving and naming what is seen, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched, or thought? Can you see that manifestation of thinking, vitaka, attack point, is the attack point of the thought arising, where you see the thought first coming up, and that the perceptment of the troubling of the person with perceptions and notions is craving, it is tanha and clinging upadana. And the mental proliferation is heavy clinging, upadana, holding on and turning it into the papancha and moving into a runaway mind. And the runaway mind is definitively papancha sanya sankara. Now in, in section 18, when there is no eye, no form, and no eye consciousness, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. When it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of feeling. And when there is no manifestation of feeling, it becomes impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. And when there is no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is no manifestation of craving, it is impossible to read when you're on my screen, right? Go off my screen. <laughs> when there is no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible 
to point out the manifestation of resentment by perceptions and notions that are born of mental proliferation. This happens the same way with the ear. Um, I want more time to talk with you, so I'm gonna whip, go through these a little faster. But when you don't have these things with the ear, it works the same way. And when it happens with the nose, it is the same way. And when it happens with the tongue, it is the same way. And then the body, when there is no body, it happens the same way. No tangible, no body consciousness, impossible, okay? And when there is a mind, let's do this one all the way through. When there's no mind, no mind object, and no mind consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. When it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is no manifestation of feeling, there is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. And when there is no manifestation of craving, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. And when there is no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Now, after explaining what is the cause and condition for the burden of the suffering, what will make this impossible to occur anymore? Then Venerable Kachana, he summarizes the detailed meaning for the monks in section 19. He says that the detailed meaning for what has been said to you is as follows. As to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferations burden a man or a woman, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold on to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being personal reactions. No, you just have no inclination to react anymore. You pause and respond. Of the underlying tendency to ignorance, and thus, this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, to quarrels and brawls, to disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speeches. Here and now, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. So this is where we go to almost to the end, now go into the commentary a little bit. Of course, it's very unlikely that any of us can live our daily lives without any perceptions happening through our sense doors. However, the Buddha encourages us to pursue the middle path as we move forward down the noble path and to find the practical level of understanding for our lives. And when speaking to the monks who have chosen to pursue the complete the path entirely, he remarks to them with the understanding of how they will receive it. But he encourages you to uncover the knowledge that you need to find balance and efficiency through the knowledge of how things work in life. He encourages you throughout his teachings to let go of all fears and gain more confidence for your professions, your innovations, and your family life. He encourages you to develop meditation as far as you need to within this life so that we can see the actuality, the truth of how everything works and live with more ease. He lets us know that we can verify everything he is teaching in the same way that he did through his own practice. The sutta supports this idea completely. The sutta keeps repeating one paragraph in particular for us, how our sense doors begin to operate and how craving builds up 
to a serious level. And this is, suggests to us that we can perceive what is happening by watching very closely. And you have the right kind of meditation to do this, what we're teaching you. The Buddha lets us know this is possible repeatedly. He says it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact when there is the manifestation of contact. At that point, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perceiving something, naming it. And when there is the manifestation of naming something in perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving is coming, pushing, happening. And when there is this manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. You can see where you feel the urge of, I like it, I don't like it, and then fall into why you don't like it or you like it. You want it or you don't want it. The uh, attachment or aversion, you feel it. And then there is uh, the manifestation of thinking. If that is there, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of besetment of perceptions and notions that are born of mental proliferation. The word manifestation means coming into being, coming into being or arising, which holds tension in it. And the idea is that as contact comes into being, uh, there are changes in our condition that we can detect. It becomes possible to see the point where feeling arises and perception jumps in to name what came up. Watching closely in your practice, you can then notice slight shifts in tension and tightness. And this is where Atta is setting the spark, getting ready to set the spark for craving to heat up and burn us we can learn to detect this point as we develop our practice. It's your cue to do your six R's. And then you can begin to notice how thinking arises and how it expands from craving into clinging. It becomes possible to notice how things change at that time when the proliferation of thoughts begin to happen. And this is the runaway mind. This thinking is obviously the clinging link in the process of dependent origination, stated under a different name in translation within the sutta. If a meditator has been tranquilizing the mind and the body properly while they are meditating, by using the steps of right effort during practice, as the tension lowers in the head, it is possible to notice an increase in the level of tension and tightness as any expansion of thought proliferation gets going. This is the principle of the lower that your tension is and tightness in your body as you're practicing. Not trying, just being there, just watching. That's why it's so important to get out of the way, to step back, to sit back and just be there to go into your sittings with the mindset, I'm just going to sit here to see what happens next. I don't make anything happen. I'm not in charge of doing anything to make this happen. My instruction is to sit here and to just be here and allow it to happen. So rather than make it, we want to allow it. Rather than do it, we want to just be and observe. What will the mind do if you stop putting any pressure on it? So what does Q says, what does this really mean? Well, for those students who are practicing the four steps of right effort, by applying the sixth step in the cycle of training, they will surely see the point where they can let go sooner to stop the flow of the thought proliferation and change the outcome of any interaction that's occurring in life. Somebody's getting you upset in a group of people and you're talking and you feel tighter and tighter and tighter. You're really annoyed and you really want to, I'm telling you, <laughs> bite your lip, don't say a word, agree with everything, leave it alone, have your coffee, have your lunch. Just listen, watch what happens. Watch how the people get all tight. Watch how it works. 
and they don't know what's happening to them. Watch it sometime at lunch with people. This is nice to know too, because for those of us who are working in everyday jobs in this world, this gives us a good opportunity to learn how each sense door operates step by step. That's what this is about. To show you every single one of those doors is working exactly the same way, including mind. And once we see this, we can relax mind's attention off a distraction faster if we're allowing mind's attention to move away from our work, we can relax the mind and the body will follow. Each time that we do that, we are letting go of unessential information. And this lets us keep on working more in comfort for longer periods of time with a smile. All the while, no matter how long the shift is, we know there will be an end to it because of a Nietzsche, because all things are impermanent. And so whenever we detect a rising tension and tightness at any level in our practice, even as perception happens to shift into thinking, it is then that we have detected an early symptom of craving, which is the very point where we begin to take things personally. And that is the spot, that is the spot to see uh, to use the release and relax steps to eliminate heavier thoughts from coming up in your mind. As long as you continue to smile, we keep on retraining our mind to lighten up more, and this always helps the mind to focus better. Less pressure on the brain, clearer the brain becomes, sharper the awareness grows. The less pressure on mind, the better the focus you can develop. And this is because mind is the forerunner of all states. The continual practice trains us to take things more lightly, and that leads to more comfort in life. No matter what task you're doing, I don't care if it's at work or school or at home, this is training that will help you to change your perspectives as you approach everything with a happier mind. Such an approach leads us to a reduction of self-conceit, helps us to let go of some of our fixed views. Aggressive behavior begins to shift into more compassionate, kinder behavior. We can let things go more easily when we decide to practice a more impersonal perspective. Always remember that practice this way all the time. And then we are letting go of what is unessential and we're replacing it with what is essential, a harmonious perspective and a harmonious practice that is leading to a harmonious life. Such a goal for everyday life, such a practice with a smile is truly a win-win situation in everyone's life. And working this like this and there's going to be quite literally a personality change that will begin to occur that people will notice and often they will comment on it. You also will naturally be releasing much of the stress that we carried before in our life. And this all happens by personally attaining knowledge and vision of how things actually work. Yata, Bhutana, Nagasana, this occurs usually midway in your development. But for us, it happens faster if, because if we're using the practice all the time in life, you can see where this starts to happen. All of a sudden, one day your mind says, so this is how it all works. Okay, I can help you, I can do what you want me to do. It's funny, it just happens and it starts taking over and six ring by itself. And that is learning precisely how thought proliferation occurs recognizing how it personally operates, releasing it, relaxing tension, keeping your smile going, and this will start gradually. And then eventually mind decides to take over automatically and a new healthier habit for life is established. The bottom line here is, although this is a pretty ancient sutta, okay, it turns out that it is um, addressing an age old problem and it's giving us a modern day solution for the challenging issue that many of us face in today's life. It gives us a path 
to reduce stress and usher in a happy, balanced mind. Don't you just love it when the Buddhism hits home run in the modern world, says Q. It's not bad for something that's nearly 2,600 years old. And we're all trying to learn how to use this now with stress and, re and relaxation and all this stuff that they're trying to do. And the answers were here all along. Going back to the sutta, the detailed meaning for what has been said is as follows. As to the source through which perceptions and notions are born of mental proliferation and they burden a man or a woman. If nothing is found, they are to delight in, welcome, and hold to. This is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being personal reactions, of the underlying tendency to ignorance, and thus this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, to quarrels and brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words and false speech. And here and now, these evil, unwholesome states will cease without remainder. And then the Venerable Kachana ended his teachings of the meaning here. I understand the detailed meaning of the summary to be thus. Now, friends, listen, if you wish, Go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. And as the Blessed One explains it to you, that so should you remember it. And then the bhikkhus, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Mahakachana's words, they rose from their seats and they went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and they told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding, then, Venerable Sir, we went to the Venerable Mahakachana and asked him about the meaning. And the Venerable Mahakachana expounded the meaning to us with these terms, statements, and phrases. Mahakachana is wise, bhikkhus. Mahakachana has great wisdom. And if you had asked me the meaning of this, I should have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana explained it. Such is the meaning of this, and so you should remember it. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda, he said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man was exhausted by hunger and weakness and came upon a honey bowl. Wherever he would taste it, he would find a sweet and delectable flavor, and so too, Venerable Sire. Any able-bodied and any able-minded bhikkhu, wherever he might scrutinize with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma, would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable Sir, what is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? And as to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse as the, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse. And this is what the Blessed One said and the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and he was delighted with the Blessed One's words. So you have this really cool um, advice and everything they're telling you here, they are actually supporting your practice that we're giving you. They are showing you exactly what we're telling you as far as the links in the dependent origination are concerned, but now they're showing you in a practical way how this is working in your conversations and in your interactions and how you can see the signs, the different points where you can let go. Remember, if you, were, if you were coming to a retreat, I was probably talking to you a little bit about, we like to think of things cut and dry in this particular time. We talk about equanimity, we say, oh, equanimity comes and it's there in the fourth jhana, just like that, see? But the equanimity has many, many different degrees of development. And so does your observation, so does your perception, 
so does the way that you decide to use your six R's. When is it that you recognize it? You don't, it doesn't have to be when you're already far away from your object of meditation. You can monitor what's really happening. How does the attention move away? Does it move away? Or is it something I do that makes that whole thing happen with the um, hindrance. This is interesting because I pointed it out to David and Yvonne and I talked about it. We have always talked about it as when it pulls you away. Did it pull you away? Did it? You think it did because you felt like something was pulling you away. But what's really happening is the motion feels like that is happening but the truth is that you let your mindfulness down you let it drop the mindfulness was your observation power you let your interest fall away on whatever your object was and your your interest and then your energy and your curiosity it all fell down and the natural thing for it is a very natural thing the natural thing for the um, for the human being to do is we are very curious. We came out of the caves and there was the saber toothed tiger, <laughs> and ever since, you know, we we are very curious species. We're like little monkeys, the same way they're curious with everything. People are like this, you know. We're curious and we move our attention. And what is that that just came up? And we think, oh, I have to go and find out what that is. But you don't. You don't need to. What is it that you think? Why do you think you have to go and see what it is? Okay. Now, um, does anybody have any questions where we are right now? And then I'm going to show you one more thing uh, that we used to talk a lot about which had to do with the laws of meditation. Really fun, <laughs> just if I can find it. Anybody have a question? I do have a question. Yes, um, so th this is amazing, by the way. <laughs> this is called, this whole thing is amazing. But um, I wanted to go back to I think it's on page 10, page 11. Uh, this is where you start at number 18. Let me go and back the, uh, the, for a second, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Let me go back. Where was it? Tell um, me. Page 10, 18, uh, 10 11. It begins at the, uh, the middle of page 10 on number 18. Um, it's that where the reading becomes, you know, starts saying um, where, when there is no I, no form, and no consciousness, et cetera, and it just keeps going like that. Um, is this a hint to a jhana state? A hint to a jhana state. Let me, I'm trying to get to page 10 to see where you are. Wait a minute. There, oh. there, there, right there. Where, where you I see the number 18. Yeah, where I was giving yeah. Okay. After the definitions, okay. yeah, after the definitions, when you see the number after 18. The definitions, where it comes in, where there is. Right there, right there. Mm -hmm. Consciousness mm -hmm. arises, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It is impossible. It is impossible. It, if there is no I, no form, no, no, it's not. Okay. They're telling you, in, well, first of all, what, when you look at all of this and you think about your thinking, and you think about these pieces up here, where I told you contact, feeling, perception, um, the manifestation, uh, the the um, manifestation of the thinking, and then the besetment and all of that. Okay, when you're in jhana, just remember one thing: when you are in the jhana, none of this is going on. Okay, you're in exactly. jhana. That's what. Listen carefully. When a hindrance mm -hmm. our, our practice is works like this because you're working with samatha and vipassana at the same time. You're getting yourself in a condition 
that is calm enough and the conditions are right for you to fall into a jhana. But when you're practicing the way we're doing it, it's a light jhana. We want it to be light to keep the mind open because we have to keep the awareness sharp because we have to keep it so that you can focally watch what's going on inside. This is what's different, okay? And so when a hindrance happens, you come out. So actually, when if I were to um, if I were to show you a picture of this, um, let me do a how do I do this? Let's see. Stop the share. Okay, now we're going to go back in there, and I'm going to open up a whiteboard for just a second. There's something that you need to understand. And we got to get rid of this guy here for a minute. Sorry, Charlie, you're going to go go sleep somewhere. <laughs> Okay, um, the, when, when we look at the person and we say when the person is, is going into the jhana, you're, um, hmm. I show people the picture like this. This is the waterfall. I'm showing you the picture where um, this water comes, the rain comes into the pond at the top of the mountain. And then it comes over and you have these little things like this. Uh, whoops, there's one, and this is a pothole under a waterfall, so this waterfall is coming down, right? And then, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, two, three, we'll just go as far as the fourth jhana, just for this experiment. We go all the way, goes all the way down to where you fall off the end into cessation and come out and experience Nibbana. So when you fall into this, when you're practicing in the beginning, your work towards practicing until the conditions are right, where this gets full enough that it can you can fall into the first jhana. Okay. Now, when you're in the jhana, when you're when you're in here in the water, okay, and you're in the jhana, you're in the jhana. And if a hindrance happens and you move your attention to move over to the hindrance to see what it is, you have left the jhana. You're you're your um, mindfulness, which is your observation, and your energy has weakened and fallen down in your interest. And when it slips, you're not in there anymore. So actually, if I, I don't know exactly how to show you, but the, um, the hindrances are out here. And, and for you to get involved in one means you have to leave here to go to them. And then you're not in jhana anymore. So our practice is uh, described in the text very well that the samatha and the vipassana are both happening evenly yoked together. What Something that's evenly yoked together are like two bulls like this, okay? These are the two bulls, okay? And um, these bulls are pulling a cart, a, a big cart behind them like this. this they're pulling a cart. So when they have their, their yoke together, the yoke goes down to this, and the harness goes like this over this bull, and it goes like this over this bull, okay? You jump out to experience the hindrance and go back into the jhanas. You're going in and out. Now, as you it's a unique practice if we talk about it, because we hear when they talk about an absorption jhana, and you get to jhana, they want you to stay there for six months to a year. Then they want you to go to the second jhana seat. So you may have, may have discovered that in five or 10 years to get to this one, you may get in there, but you can look at a long time. It'll be a shorter time because you did it one time, just like any of this, the next time it's easier. But they want you to stay in it and become totally, our approach is different. There's nothing in the text that says you should do it that way. That whole approach comes from something he was practicing before he was, his mind was liberated, before he was awakened. And it, pulled, it came back on top of it after he was gone. And you have to understand, 99.9% .9 of the big teachers that are teaching today are teaching based on the Bible of meditation. And what is that? The Vasudhimaga. And what is the Vasudhimaga is very important to understand. The person who put that big book together, okay, that big book, it's not that he put it together or wrote it and he's an author and he's a meditator. He's, he's an intellectual and a poly scholar and was an academic. 
and his job wasn't to write a book about what the Buddha said or did or taught. His job was to pull together 225 commentaries, condense them and compile them into one book and say, this is what Buddhism was. And then uniquely, like some kind of movie script, uh, the library burned down and the 225 commentaries are gone. So none of us can look and see what they really said. But when he met something he didn't quite understand, he worked it out. And he worked it out in, in this way in the section, one third of the book is meditation. And when he figures something out, the problem is he was a Brahmin for longer than he was a Buddhist monk when he comes over to do the job. See the problem? He grew up as a Brahmin family practicing the old way. So when he has a question on meditation, that's where he goes. Because in his world, we, we predict this is all me just predicting what it is. Nobody really knows. But you're looking at somebody who has to, that's a question about, well, I practiced all those years with our family priest and, you know, in my village. And this is the way we did everything. So it must mean that. So when he solves the problem, that's how he solves it. Because why? Because he, the book was based on the commentaries. They decided along the way after the Buddha was gone, what we're teaching you, his exact words, was just for the people and for the farmer and just simple stories and stuff like that. And not really, uh, the, hot, the really good stuff is uh, coming from the Abhidhamma, which is fascinating because that didn't even get written until 300 years after the Buddha's gone. <laughs> you know, so if you, it, right now, universe, you see the predicament we're in, you see? So when we come and we find this, where did this practice we're teaching you come from is very interesting, okay? In the Eightfold Path, but also in the, in the texts, the Majjhima Nikaya, the Samyutta Nikaya, the Digha Nikaya, and the Anguttara Nikaya, Right effort and right striving is very clearly four steps. Why do I say that? Well, because it's part of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And if we count them, there's four, 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 five, five, seven, eight. So there's four foundations of mindfulness, four, four spiritual powers, um, four steps of right effort. Got it? The four steps in right effort in the text in the suttas basically says, recognize when you have an unwholesome mind state in your mind. Step two, release the unwholesome mind state. Step three, bring up a wholesome mind state. Step four, keep that wholesome mind state going and make more wholesome mind states and keep going in the wholesome. The whole entire teaching is based on, let's see, I practiced before I was a Buddha, when I was a Bodhisattva, where he tells the monks, I practiced about the unwholesome life. I stayed over there a few weeks. It was, uh, uh, you know, okay. <laughs> I went over here. I practiced in the wholesome side much better. People want to work with me. Everybody gets along. Everything's working well. And we think that the, uh, that sutta is the, um, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, number, um, all right, is it number um, 19? And that sutta, is like listening to somebody talk about a high school science project for science fair. I'm going to test what floats and what sinks. It's that defined. And, he, and you see, then this is echoed through the text. His whole teaching was about shifting over. So when he's talking about this practice, when you get all the pieces, they don't come in one spot. When you take those four steps of right effort, you add the relaxed step. Why? Why do we do that? Well, we tested it, but why did Bonte put it in there to begin with? Because the best recorded, preserved instructions for a meditation happen in the Anapanasati Sutta, um, that, the instructions, and there's 16 dyads, okay, 16 two-part pieces, I think 16. And in there, there are steps that have to do on the in-breath, one tranquilizes the bodily formation, and the out-breath, one tranquilizes the bodily formation. On the in-breath, one tranquilizes the uh, mental formation. On the out-breath, one tranquilizes the mental formation. Those two pieces have been left out of training since before I was involved 20 years back. And back into the 70s and 60s, nobody ever heard of it because it's not in the Visuddhimagga the same way. 
Now, when you read those, you have to have some information and understand some things about the teaching because it could get confusing when, uh, you know, when you read the steps. It sounds like you should be working hard, but you have to understand that there are variations to defining the words that are used in the translation. The translation we're using is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. The reason we use it and are devout to it, I might add, is because it's the working translation. If we go to someone else's translation, they change words in a different way than we, we don't, we change some words, but only as synonyms, get it? So if there's a word like uh, extirpate, and most people don't know what that means, I'm going to say pull it out by the root, see, instead. If I say applied and sustained thought, you don't know what I'm talking about. I can watch 30 people. They don't know what I'm talking about. Uh-huh, they're all sitting there. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. But if I say thinking or examining thought, everybody goes, oh, yeah, I know what that is. So we've spent years making the, the words easier for you to understand the steps. When we take you to the point where you fall into this... Um, first jhana, you still have experiences that you have to work through for the stability of your equanimity. When um, your jhana goes like, so we sort of looks like this, one, two, three, four. Now, fourth jhana, what happens here is there's, there's four more pieces that go like this, and these are the mental states, okay, like that. And this one is infinite space, this one is infinite consciousness. This one's nothingness. And this one's neither perception nor non perception. He wanted a big name. Okay. And then it goes here and then it falls off. When it falls off, it falls off into cessation. When it comes, when you turn back on, this is what we see the experience of Nibbana being. We see what happens. The mind opens in a particular way and certain things change for you physically and mentally, and we can ask you questions. And if it fits, we can say, you probably did this. That's the way I treat it. Probably this is what this is. Now, whether a, you, know, you go through a mundane, a series of mundane Nibbanas before you go through a super mundane Nibbana, which we've never seen anybody do since we've been doing this, okay? And we have, a lot of people have ideas about the Arahat ship being gone at this point in the development of Buddhism. But the Sotapanna, Sakadagami, and Anagami levels of attainments, the doors are still open. And each one of the fruitions are possible for each one of those. So that's six times you can experience a mundane Nibbana where you go through and come out and make an attainment. So we've seen people happen and seen how the people change and follow them. I'm right, giving you a lot because I know who you are and I want to teach you and I hope you get in my next retreat. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you're looking at this here, you're in the first jhana in this water. Like I said, while you're there to experience a hindrance, you go out of the, the jhana and then depending on what happens, you come back in again to your object of meditation. Here's your, your object of meditation and say here, right? And you come back in and you work on this level until it gets full enough so that um so that it can go over and fall into the second john and those have certain traits when you come through a retreat you get a training in 111 and the anupada sutta and we take sariputta's sutta the 111 as a very clear description of what we're doing okay the reason I showed you the, the, the two bulls pulling the cart is the problem with the idea that you would separate these two uh, at one point, it was hundreds of years ago, it got separated to, to jhana practice is samatha practice, okay? And over here we have vipassana. And of course the nature of human beings is, my, God, my dog's bigger than your dog and mine's better than yours. <laughs> You know, so you have this thing going on between these two groups, and um, the, there, are, there are side effects for just doing this one, and there's side effects for just doing that one. That's why the Buddha, in, he came to, he figured out how he, he did what he did by going through to Nibbana. He changed something, and sometimes I teach that sutta, and you listen to it, you begin to, to learn 
about more about the, it has to do with the hindrances. And he tells you all the things he tried and he tells the monks, don't spend time doing that. And uh, he's warning you against trying to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, uh, you know, suffocate them, suppress them, subdue them and all that. Leave it alone. Just uh, release them, relinquish them, allow them, permit them, and they will just fade away. And he teaches you that what's wrong with the hindrances is they want to be fed. And when they come to visit you, the food they want is your attention. You make the hindrance bigger. You make it stronger and everything. So what happens with the hindrance, it's not happening while you're in this, in the jhana. You, you, when you're pulled away, you're literally pulled out of the jhana to either get involved with it or just, just let it go. That's what your six hours are about the moment you feel something. When I mentioned the laws of meditation, I can find them. I had them. <laughs> It's really funny how I keep losing these guys. I don't know why. Um, there's 10 of them that we came up with. And when you listen to these, they're talking to you about the condition that you should be attempting to maintain while you are, um, here we go, while you are practicing. And the laws uh, were something that I was curious about and another scientist was curious about. It was a strange retreat. It was in Pohang, in Penang, down in Penang, Malaysia. And there were about 17 people there and very good meditators from about 11 different countries. And we, they were, when I say good people, they were serious meditators and uh, they were, uh, people who did different kinds of detailed types of work and investigation, right? And um, they wanted to know the same thing. Our, and so we came up with a list. The group came up with a list. So anyway, this is how your, your jhanas are happening in your, um, how it's happening here. And then when you have a, a hindrance, you people tend to go out and get involved in the hindrance and then come back. You shouldn't be getting involved in it at all. We can show you the suttas that say, absolutely do not ever engage anything that arises in your meditation. There is nothing that is important enough for you to leave your object of meditation. And that's what we, there's a, you know, we're in conflict with some people saying, go sit with them until they go away. The problem is they're never gonna go away because you have announced you have oatmeal, eggs, and bacon for them. <laughs> You see, as soon as you're sitting there paying attention to them, you're feeding them. You see, that's the problem. And um, in order to go down the path real easily, if you pay attention to these laws, but and you have to keep an eye on them and check as you keep a journal, am I, what am I doing about this? So the laws go like this. Um, can you erase this again? Let me see if I can erase it. Okay, this one. We do have a drawing of this if you want, you know, I can, if you send me your email, I'll send you a picture of that. We have some drawings that we can do. Okay, and we get rid of the cows again. <laughs> Look at them all. Okay. Um, first one is the, um, the law of karma. And that's an easy one to explain, you know, the law, the law of karma. Just don't get in, involved in it. The law of karma is the first one, kama. We say kama. Sanskrit say karma, we say kama in Pali, okay? Second one is um, the law of anicca. Now, what we tried to do was, and this is all flexible, anybody listening to this, when you hear it, remember, you can write me a note and say, well, that's not right, or we should have this one too. Then you have a law of dukkha. And then you have um, the um, atta, and then you have the anatta, anatta, right? Then we have these, we didn't quite know what to call them. We call the one object 
attitude, object, attitude. And the next one we called um, hindrance attitude. And hindrance, you could also say hindrance knowledge and attitude, but we sort of said hindrance attitude. An attitude when you're flying, an attitude is you, are you staying steady on a course? And um, if you're falling off the course, your attitude is wrong. You have to fix the attitude on the gauge and change it, you know? Another one is um, the law of nutriment. Nutriment, law of nutriment. The law of the mind. And um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, eight. Oh, we have 11 of them, okay. And then I'm gonna put this other one up here. Well, I'll stick it somewhere like knowledge. and vision. And this was an absolute by the Buddha in his, in his meditation school. And then the law of dependent origination. Okay. So the first one is you just need to understand what it is and then forget about talking about it. And that's comma. And so with comma, you have four little pieces to remember. Chaitana, Kama, Vipaka, and Kamapala. And the reason I do it this way is not that I'm doing it this way, but in some old books we found out they used to do it this way. And now they changed it a little. But Chaitanya means your intention. Kama is the action you take. Vipaka is the ripening. Kamapala is the fruit. You cannot grow an apple tree and say that Vipaka means Kamapala because you have to have an apple come from a blossom and ripen to become an apple. So they're skipping one. Nowadays they say Vipaka is the Kamapala. I refuse to do it because there's definitely, I'm too much of a gardener. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do it. Anicca is a law. Whatever arises, passes away. And we talk about Anicca as impermanent, right? We say impermanent. Dukkha, to really understand the suffering, you go to 141, which we'll do, we'll do that one night. And there's a paragraph for every piece of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, right? Okay. So the suffering is both mental and physical and is divided and all of it is described. So this is, this is very well, it is defined. So I usually say this is defined and you can go to 141 and you find it in MN 141, okay? Anatta, uh, atta, of course, is the, um, is the problem for us. The, uh, the atta is the idea of, we always say it's the idea of a self and that this one is no self, but it chases everybody away. So instead, we explain it by saying the consequences of if you think you are an individual self, what is the consequence of that? The consequence is you take everything personal. So when we look at the aspect of atta, we see the behavioral stuff happening as personal opinion. This is person, full of personal opinion. And it goes towards the selfish. It has the, the danger of going towards the selfish. Okay, the atta is coming back to the natural state of witnessing, just witnessing. So when you're sitting, there's not a person sitting there. You're just a being that's sitting there and your intention is an investigation to see what mind, the power of mind and potential of mind that could open up if it wasn't working so hard doing all this other stuff that the Atta is pushing it to do. So 
what you're really doing is you're coming back to the natural state of witnessing. This is the impersonal nature. The impersonal, um, impersonal nature of everything. And that is the natural state. Object attitude is very important. Okay, um, let's see, had hindrance attitude first, right? Oh, I skipped, oh, object attitude, okay. Object attitude, um, what you're working on, it, see, this is like um, these two, you have to see, one is, uh, it has to do with perspective. And this is a perspective, and this one is is a personal perspective. So when somebody's speaking to you, you're always on the defense of you taking everything personally. And anatta, everything is an impersonal perspective. And so your whole picture of the world in front of you, it changes. Impersonal perspective. Okay, when we look at object, um, the object attitude is where it comes back to the... Um, the natural state, I'm sorry, object, where is object? I'm missing it. object attitude, come back to the natural state uh, and just be witnessing. Your object has nothing for you at all in meditation. So the question came up with the students then why do we have an object? Why don't we just practice choiceless awareness? Because then you just would go all over the place. So what is the purpose of it? And the purpose of it is to anchor you in the harbor so you can sleep in the boat at night and it won't float away. <laughs> you know, that's really what it is. But the anchor has no information for you at all and doesn't tell you anything about how to drive the boat or steer it or anything else, right? It's just an anchor. But don't, don't fixate on the anchor. You, you, if I say anchor, sometimes people take it wrong. Uh, what this is, so we went to this way of saying it is the recentering point, or it is a home base for you to come back to if you're pulled away by an, a hindrance. You understand? That's what it is. And if we give it to you as the breath, sometimes people make more of the breath than is necessary and think it is something tremendously important where it's just the centering point for you to come back to if you're pulled away. Then the next one is hindrance attitude and hindrance attitude more than any of it is, the hindrance attitude is, do you know how the hindrance works? If you don't, you will buy into fighting with it like it's an enemy, but it's not an enemy. If you understand, if you listen to the lessons, all the suttas and all the teachings in the Samyutta Nikaya and Majjhima Nikaya and the other books about the hindrance and take them into consideration, you'll understand why you should leave them alone and they'll go home and take their distractions with them. <laughs> That's what they'll do. Leave them alone. They're only coming to bug you to see if you're going to feed them. And what is the food? What is the nutriment for the hindrance? I am my personal attention. And when I leave my object, when I am, go to that hindrance, the moment I want to know what it is, I left my object. The moment I say, well, where have you been? And why are you here? And what are you about? Well, then I'm really in trouble. So it's like, you know, it's the message is leave them alone. And the message the Buddha gave that was very firm, do not engage. And that's in number 22, Majimi Kai number 22. And then this danger of nutriment, what is the truth about nutriment? Nutriment, we operate nutriment from where we sit in our meditation in any problem that goes into our meditation as we're practicing it's coming from us it's not happening to us it's coming from us so we are the source of nutriment for trouble we feed attention in the wrong way in the wrong direct wrong place 
and we cause our own problems like that. So we have to be very careful to not do that and just take a look at building our energy, our balance, our equanimity, and the other factors that are involved in this. And then um, you have the, uh, the law of, um, let me say mind. I don't know why I did that one. Oh, okay. The law of mind is absolute, and we like to forget it. One, especially one place that you say it at the retreat, you say mind is, uh, the forerunner of all states, all states, and from your mind it flows down into the body and operates the body, and all the organs, everything that keeps you alive, it all starts in mind. That's how important it, this whole thing is. Okay, and um, if we forget that then we get ourselves involved in stuff that's none of our business. But if we keep relaxing mind and having it comfortable and just relaxing it quiet and stop analyzing, stop digging, stop. See, all the questions you have, everything you want to know is yours right here being given to you. If you only were to follow the instructions, everything is answered. But people come in, they just hem and haw and they analyze and they break the rules and they won't follow the instructions we mix them up turn them around put a little bit of this in throw a little bit of that oh this worked over here i'll put this in here too they play that game and and we have a sutta actually in the in the majima nikaya for the monks that says basically if you don't uh if you break if you have six of these problems there's 16 pieces and if you have all 16 you're a fantastic student but if you have four or six of them wrong, we should not teach you anymore because you will suck us dry and take our life away. And the Buddha said, don't, you have one life, go out and teach the Dhamma. But if somebody prevaricates, talks back to you, walks around what you just said, altercates, uh, he goes back and forth with you constantly, a few times, fine, one retreat maybe, yeah. But not again and again, just, you just need to just don't do it with them because they're not going to follow your instructions. And the problem with the whole system is, frankly, it's too darn easy to be acceptable in a, in, in a space age where everything is tremendously complex. I don't even understand my phone or my computer anymore. I don't understand my phone. <laughs> I laugh about it all the time. You ask Dama Gavesi, I call him up, oh my gosh, what is my phone done? You know, today it was like my computer, the screen split in half. Why did it, I touched something, oh my gosh, you know? And um, <laughs> I used to, computers used to be so powerful for me. And now I went in the forest for seven years, came out and I'm like a baby, <laughs> you know? Okay, um, knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision is a law in the Buddhist school. It's a law in the Buddhist, Buddhist school, Buddha meditation, med school, whatever you want to say, okay? He demands that you learn by listening to him and then sitting the next day with what you learned and examining it and testing it for yourself to see if it really does work. He doesn't want you to believe anything he even said to those monks. And that's, there's a few places where that is actually brought up. Don't even believe what I say, but you should be responsibly testing it. And it means knowing by seeing something is highly valuable in the practice because that's how you learn it inter internally. And um, it means they weren't doing it back then. And they're not doing it today a lot of times. They listen to the guru and the guru says this and that's it and that's the word of God and that's the end of it. No questions. That's why questions and questions are how your knowledge comes. And then the very um, last one is dependent origination. I'm gonna leave that till next week, okay? And we'll go over that next week. In uh, next, um, actually next Saturday is when we're really gonna tear it apart. I'm not uh, going to do a pre-class on Wednesday. Suttas that uses it, like this sutta used it, parts of it. 
and you see dependent origination with 12 pieces popping up as 5, 7, 9, 11, 12, and then 23. So you see it popping up with all these different numbers. And when you don't understand what it is, you can make whole theses about he contradicted himself and taught it one way and the other way. It's none of that's true. It's totally in sync. Everything is fine. Okay. It's just that when he teaches with five, seven, nine, or 11, he's teaching somebody who's already been taught 12 and they know it by heart. And then he can speak to them that way where it's necessary to teach you. When I give you the, the, the practice chart of seven links, I've taught you the 12 and you understand why I'm giving you the seven links because those are the ones you can watch all the time, all day long in everything, everyone in the house where you live and where you work. And when you watch people at the train station or the airport or the cow in the field, you can watch it, it happening. You can watch it. But the other part is something that you can't see until you're way advanced and very, very completely in advanced, uh, equanimity and total quiet and then you can possibly see these other pieces but they're not important to see the most important ones are the ones that fix your life now here with what you're living with that that are the ones that help you to understand how to fix relationships and stuff okay so that's the story of these pieces does everybody have this somebody needs to say something i'll leave it on the chart i'm going to Blank it out and come back to you now. Do we have any questions on this now? I think Deepa had some questions. Yeah? Yeah. Um, my question was regarding the um, consciousness, men, men, uh, ment, uh, material, uh, mentality and materiality, and the six sense doors. These three seem to be braided together almost. It's it seems to be that it all comes together. Okay, the way, the way it works together, okay, the way the contact works is the eye meets color and form and just sees this as color and form. It doesn't see a cushion, okay? Perception is what says red and green cushion, okay? Perception is like blinking your eyes. It's not an actual step. It's sort of something that happens on the way through the eye, um, the form, and the eye consciousness. Those are the three pieces that make it so contact can happen. Okay? Now, when you're talking about the links, when we go over those, you have ignorance, formations, consciousness, and then you have mentality, materiality. You don't go looking to see mentality, materiality. And the most useful way to teach it to a student when you begin to learn about dependent origination is that when I'm, why am I explaining it about to you at all? Is because I'm explaining it to you how the, the cognition works, how we events are actually happening. And we teach it to you as a phen one phenomenological event at a time. The phenomena arising in one event at a time that is logical for me to examine one event at a time. It's the only way to really uh, dissect how a man has anger problems is to look at one event at a time and learn how the one event occurs, you see? So when we're, when we're looking at um, when something upsets you, when you hear it, you have the ear, you have a sound and ear consciousness. So the contact has a mental, and a external sound happening. So it's internal and external part, right? Okay, now, when you say um, consciousness cognizes, so that's what's understanding everything. And the next one is basically mentality, materiality. He says the mentality, materiality. So each of your links that when the process of cognition is taking place, it has a physical part that operates. And we're going to say this is the earth element of my ear right here. And it also, for the ear to operate, it, ha it has to be a working ear with the physical part of it. And I have to have the mental part of it operating. 
and we, as we explained before, the first link of consciousness is the swimming pool in the backyard with all the consciousness for your whole life to use. And then each of your, your, each of your sense doors, the eye has, when activates it, it's, it's just gasoline in a, in a big tank. Doesn't mean anything until you put it in a car and turn it on and use it, right? With a car. This is consciousness in a pool inside you somewhere doesn't matter where but eye consciousness cannot work through the nose nose consciousness can't work through the eye or the or the ear you see you can't mix them up so we know eye consciousness works with the eye nose consciousness with the nose ear consciousness with the ear this is how it actually is operating so there's two things here the concept he's construct he figured out and then how does it work Will you activate the chemical and it, then it becomes it's active and it operates. That's how we're looking at it. So he calls Nama Rupa. The other piece of Nama Rupa, what the material part and the mental part, the Rupa is the uh, physical earth part in the, the um, Nama is the uh, mental part. Okay. Now, <laughs> the, um, I just had a senior moment. I love these senior moments. It's really fun. <laughs> it went out the other ear. I can't remember what it was I was going to say. Um, but basically, um, you, can't, you don't have to go searching for these. From the six sense doors, Nama Rupa. If we talk about the links, okay, when we talk about the links, listen carefully. We're just going to ignorance, formations, consciousness, the Nama Rupa, okay, mentality, materiality, and the six sense doors. Now, the one ignorance, we just slough it off and say, you don't know anything, so you're ignoring this whole process. So we tuck that one away and we make it black or gray on the chart. These guys, these here, we make these, uh, this is um, formations, consciousness, Nama Rupa, and the six sense doors. We make the, the, um, formations in consciousness uh, and, um, and we make those two yellow and we say those are potentials you're not going to watch for them in your meditation don't try it it's silly it's unnecessary but the six the the uh, mentality materiality you have to understand how it functions with contact you need to be aware of it but again it's just something that's there in the body okay right it's just there. It's not you making it work, right? Okay. And the next one is six sense doors and six sense doors. So these guys, what I did on the chart was I said, okay, those are imperson uh, impersonal, meaning they are part of the operation of the anatomical body, their physical and mental structure of the human being. You do not have anything to do with them operating. We agree, right? right. Okay. Always remember that because what you're interested in, if you're going to change your behavior and change your life and change your mind, you're interested in what happens when from contact happens and then um, feeling and actually up to there, you don't have anything to do with how contact works and you don't have anything to do with the initial feeling that comes up. Mm -hmm. Feeling is not emotion. Drill it into your head. Feeling is initially registered on equipment as pleasant, painful, or neutral. Okay? Okay. Um, so is that the earliest point where I, uh, is that the earliest point where I will become aware of it and I can catch it? You catch it as the feeling comes up as craving as the one that hits you first in the beginning of your training because that's where I first appears. So from craving, clinging, habitual tendency, and the birth of reaction are very, very personal. You mm -hmm. are behind it. I am behind it. I mm -hmm. am totally involved with those links. They cannot occur and operate without me. Uh, so understanding if I move out of the picture and mm -hmm. take Thing less personally, I am cutting down on the pressure of wanting to make this work. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay, now we'll go into the, I don't want to go any further than that right now with the dependent origination. Anybody else have any questions for tonight? May? Sister Kema, I have two questions. So going back to page 10 of the definition, um, so the mental proliferation there is, is defined as upadana, so it is not the sankara which is in the no. earlier part of the no, it's not. Clinging, upadana, is very much an I have this. It's runaway mind, May. Runaway mind. It's when you say, oh my gosh, these things are just coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Or you think of an idea. Vitaka is like we say in the, in the book he's talking about, the monk uh, created. Um, he has the vitaka. And then the vichara is coming out of the, the thought seed, like first thought. And it's like this, you're driving the car and you remember you have to get the milk. That was the taka. <laughs> and then what kind of milk did she say I should get? Or should it be with cream or without cream? Should it be large or small? Whose kind of milk should I get and everything else? That's vichara, okay? And then when you go in the market, it's wonderful today, isn't it? A modern market. <laughs> When you go in the market, I should have told it about the cat litter instead. Oh, gee. <laughs> they told me to go and buy the cat litter from the, from the monastery once. And I went to Walmart to get the cat litter. Now, what could be easier than buying a bag of cat litter, right? And I went to buy the cat litter. And um, when I got to the aisle, I had, don't forget the cat litter. That's like cat litter, bitaka. And then... I wonder if she told me what kind of cat litter I should get. We're getting into Wichara. That's more clinging. And, and is it like I used to get? Is it like my cat, my sister's cat? I wonder what they had that didn't smell. And did I, what should I look for? And then I turn the corner and I go into the aisle. And at Walmart, they had 11 different kinds of cat litter for sale. 11 different kinds of ways that a cat could... <laughs> And I'm there like, what is this about? What is wrong with our society that anybody would create 11 different kinds of cat litter? You see, so by then I was in, um, I was in um, Papancha, definitely, tearing my head out. What am I going to do? Should I call her? Should I find out? Should I call a friend? What's good? What's bad? What's, you know, going to make us sick? What smells? What doesn't? <laughs> I went into Papancha's state of craziness. And papancha sanya sankara. So what does it mean? So papancha is crazy thinking, going, 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 overwhelming you about something, right? And the sanya is perceiving, over, over activating the perception, perception, perceiving, 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 compounding over itself like this, you know? And it's like, um, it's like having somebody who's your, your, your friend is sick and in the hospital and it's her husband's birthday. And she says to you, could you buy my husband a shirt? And you go to the store and you don't know what size the shirt is or what size his neck is or the length of his sleeve. And you realize, what am I going to do? Or then what, what patterns does he like? And it just goes all over the place. It's like looking at a tree. Papancha is like looking. Vitaka is like the seed in the ground. And, uh, you know, the um, vichara is like the sprout with some little pieces on it, just a little bit of the small tree. And the papancha is the whole tree <laughs> coming all over the place and you're stuck in the subject and you can't get out. That's the way it was described with a tree. I think he used a tree in the book. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. another one, go ahead. Yeah, another one. I don't know if it's to do with the translation. So um, it keeps repeating, it says, where there is no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of resentment by perception and notion born of mental proliferation. 
So that statement, this statement by perception and notion born of mental proliferation makes me think. That's right. That's right. Okay. Think that mental proliferation comes before the statement by perception and notion. But if we go to the, the no, 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 no. They built the perception. Okay, let's go to the. Let's go to the. Um, I I know how you're caught. Uh, we go back to the. Uh, Wait a second, I go there, I will, <laughs> here, and go back into it. Uh, and this should be pretty close. Let's do one piece of it. Whoops, wait a minute, I have to take you guys a minute. Okay, um, I, I know exactly how you got caught because I, I used to get caught that way um, to do it. Whoops, wait. Oh, come on. Up. Ah, I can't get you guys. All right, that's all right. Uh, okay, here's where you go. Um, you see, you're taking through the process. We wanna, which one you want to do? The body, which one you want to do? The body? You care? Okay. Yes. Do the body or a oh, yes. body? Okay, body. Yes. Okay. Um, when there is a body, a tangible and body consciousness. So the three pieces to make the contact. It is possible to point out the manifestation. A contact will happen. You will, contact can happen. Now, when there is the manifestation of, uh, when there is the sign of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. The sign of feeling will happen next. Because with the condition, contact as conditioned feeling arises. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. Perception is a starring role in this sutta, more so than in most cases. But in this one is saying perception. That's where you, the feeling, you, with feeling as condition, you perceive it. You perceive the feeling. So now you're starting to get involved in the feeling and might even say to yourself, why is that there? why is the feeling there in your mind when there is the, the sign of the perception that you've named this feeling a painful feeling say a painful feeling in your back or something and then then it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving because the moment you perceive the pain in your back you're going to say i don't like this and that is the craving i don't like this Perceiving it's not a problem. Perceiving it's a pain in your back and your body is okay. But I don't like it is the craving. When there is the sign for the craving, it becomes possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. You start to think beyond, almost immediately beyond, I don't like it because you slip into, I don't like it because. And with the manifestation of the thinking, it becomes possible to point out the besetment of perception and notions. Perception and notions here are the, um, the pushing towards the um, papancha, where it folds over a lot on itself. The thinking after the craving is the clinging. The thinking is clinging in this story. And the, be the, uh, uh, the besetment means you are troubled by the papancha where it's just rolling over in your mind okay rolling and rolling that are born of the mental proliferation now what is mental proliferation mental proliferation is another word for clinging extended clinging that's what that is you got it you see okay proliferation means that when you said i don't like it and then you said i don't like it because blah 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 in my mind the blah 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 was a proliferation of thinking and those are remember this is the tough part <laughs> remember when we talk about this that mentally and physically this is happening whoosh, in circles so fast in your brain you can't even count if i go like that that's 150,000 circles of the of the wheel spinning you see on top of itself and so this wheel if we try to draw it we can't draw it it's very frustrating you end up saying it must have been like a um 
like a like a whirlpool whirlpool and at the top it was like this and if you've ever been sucked down in a whirlpool and you allow yourself to be sucked down it gets faster and faster at the bottom and shoots you under the water and then if you know what you're doing you can swim right up you're gone you're outside the whirlpool but at the bottom it's very 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 spinning like this a hundreds of miles you know thousands of miles an hour you see that's what's happening you get it it's like a pressure cooker <laughs> and it starts with like a tick, you know uh, and you just see something and wow then you're off to the races <laughs> um, sister Kima, can i just ask one more question so it's related to us um when we do the six hours we're supposed to roll in the six hours and like sister Kima was saying the other day Banta said each roll should be about three seconds not more is, no each each one of the whole cycle is three seconds uh, sorry yeah it's each one of the whole cycle is it because when, when faster. this whole oh, faster. is it what yeah. is it is it because this whole process of what's going on um each consciousness that arises is so quick that we need to overcome or not allow that momentum pro proliferation to build up so in order to not allow it to build up don't, don't try to stop anything don't try to stop anything you just said you said the uh you said the you oh naughty 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 <laughs> you said the wrong thing you said, i forget what you call it you said the wrong one you said, oh, do we have to, we want to stop this? No, we don't want to stop it. We want to allow it and not pay any attention to it. Big difference. The moment somebody says, but I need to control it, but I need to make it stop coming up, you're, you're gone. You're not going to go anywhere. You're no progress, okay? As soon as you said anything that related to me, it's, you're gone. See, the whole thing is, I am not here. You just see me. I am not here. I am nothing. And when I said, uh, there is, uh, I am nothing. And anything that comes up, I'm not going to feed it. My, I've already told my brain, I'm not going to feed it anymore. And it believes me. Pretty much it believes me. There's some subjects I'm still getting stuck on. <laughs> you know, but, but most of the time there's nothing that's where you want to go no personal reaction at all you you are embracing anatta what is anatta i am not here nothing is personal everything is naturally happening and whatever arises will always pass away this is where the moment someone says to you if you're going to teach anybody or share this with anybody the moment that someone says but I need to, that's not it. No, you don't need to, anything. You don't need, you just need to be, sit down and be. Your mindset for going into meditation is only to sit still to see what happens next. What is that? It's not to do anything, get it? And that, it's hard, it's tough because everywhere else, they're pushing you to do, to climb, to be the best, to win, to overcome, and all this stuff. And we're saying, the Buddha comes along and says, I'm going to ask you to not control anything so that you can see what happens if you don't. And it gets very quiet, and the, and the hindrances, if they're not given any attention at all, they just go away because they just want to... They're hungry and they come to you to eat and it's your attention that will feed them, okay? So the moment you say, oh, sorry, no more cookies in the thing. <laughs> no more, no more cookies in the cookie box. They're not, no more tea. See? Yeah? Okay, thank you, sister. You'll catch yourself if you write reports in your journals the way I'm telling you to and you read them tomorrow, you're going to, 
with a red pen circle where you said, and all I have to do is make it stop. And all I have to do is do, and I have to, no, now rewrite it on the other page without I, me, my, or mine. And you're much closer to what you're needing to have as a position for your practice. See? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, sister. Anybody else? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Deepa, did you have any more? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. We okay? Okay. Good. So, um, should we end now? I think we're pretty much done. Um, we uh, uh, are doing pretty well. We're having more and more questions, which is very good. And like I said, I, the best service I can give to you, I've been thinking about this for the last three days, the best service I can give to you is to drown you in dependent origination and dependent co-arising. If I can get you to the level where you have memorized the pieces, it's like on Wednesday, I'll give you the page with just the pieces with the, the English and the Pali names, okay? And you start running it up and down and you get that much really down. Then when we do the workshop on Saturday, you're gonna be with me and you're, you are gonna hear things in this workshop that you have heard some of it before but now you're going to hear it go like this, click, 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 click and fit together, see? Because there's a lesson when you teach people about dependent origin, you don't just sit down and teach them. You have to preface it first. And there's the prefacing lesson. And the other thing is, of course, there's some of you here who are just sitting there thinking, where is she getting this stuff she's teaching? So... <laughs> You know, so I, in the workshop, I have all these little footnote things about where it is in the text so that you can go dig to your heart's content. Where did the progress chart, where is it? You, and uh, Sister Kema, you yeah. want uh, this uh, workshop uh, the Saturday that people should have uh, charts and paper, pen and paper? This is the problem. Can I trust you? <laughs> You see, um, do I send them just the pages that are the, uh, without the chart and, for, and get them to make the chart? Or do I give you the chart? Because giving the chart shoots a hole in the Chinese proverb that the only way to really learn something is to, uh, to hear it and to um, say it and write it and then actually do it, you see? You have to see me doing it, but I want you to write it and build the chart. So that when you come to the class on Saturday, what you are gonna need, I was gonna tell you this on Wednesday, <clears throat> you need to come with uh, two sheets of plain white paper that has a piece of tape, so you have a long piece of paper. You can go and uh, see on the workshop where, where uh, on YouTube, what it was because it was a it was two sheets of paper taped together so there was a big long page and then it's divided into 12 columns you see and it has a label for the poly and english title at the top and then in each column the definitions are written in by hand and when you go through this step by step by the end of that chart you understand which of these were personal pieces, which are, um, which are um, potential pieces or um, preparation pieces. We like to say preparation now, preparation pieces, and which part were the um, impersonal ones that had absolutely nothing to do with you, and which ones in our personal pieces in the red zone, the one that you have to practice with all the time. And then, you take and fold your chart and put the ones that are the preparation pieces and the impersonal pieces and put them away. So you have just seven pieces left. That's your training chart. And then I'll send you the file and you can have the actual training chart. 
And when you have the training chart, you put it with you when you take it with you when you sit in meditation and you want to understand how it's working or you keep it in your pocket and look, did I see this? When this car accident happened that I watched, did it, did I see this? What did the people do? Can I see it with these two people arguing in the airport? When I'm in the train station, when something happens, you know, can I see what's happening in terms of what's going on? It's amazing. And what he did, he essentially had this piece of film that are the, the frames of the movie of how you're operating in life. And then he, he went in the, he went into the, editing room and cut the frames and said, yeah, but you don't need to know that. And this part is nothing to do with you personally. So we'll just go like that. Now we have seven frames. If, if that's how you master fixing yourself and understanding how did I become depressed or anxiety or have a panic attack? How did I fall into grief and get consumed? How did I get angry? How does it all work? And the seven link chart tells you everything for this lifetime and how it works. See? How it works. Okay? Okay, then. If, if colored pencils are a good idea or getting a set of highlighters that are um, yellow ones and green ones and red ones, highlighters. And if you have a yellow one, a green one, and a, a red one, you get to mark the... Uh, the uh, preparation ones with yellow and the impersonal ones that just have to do with the body are green. And then the red zone is what we work on. And we, sh we talk about how I give you, I will give you one chart that is an empty chart. And you, um, after we, um, when you look at the empty chart of seven links, and there's a set of uh, emotions on the side. When and is then, this chart uh, you are uh, going to share? When are you going to share this chart? Or are you going to do this on the uh, workshop? Or on, the workshop. On, on the workshop. workshop. Okay. On the workshop. Can you give me a comprehensive uh, kind of a, uh, announcement for Wednesday and Saturday? I was thinking I could, I was thinking I could do the white the the seven links as a white chart again without any definitions on it and they could write the definitions in there on the on the white chart and then it would have the emotions on the side and then they'd have to work the graph that was the exercise you work the different things through that are problems for you see what i mean get the idea wait i can show you that <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, can I do that? <laughs> I think I can. Wait just a second. Um, Um, just one second, 107, 107. Hmm. Oh, okay. No, I can't do it. I don't know where it is. It's going to take too long. Okay, no problem. It's going to take too long. There's a white chart that has the seven training links. And it has the name of the links at the top. I can make a blank chart and they can fill that in. 
How would that be? Hmm? Okay. Okay, then. Then they could fill it in. And then they could do the exercise, which tells you the emotional states on the left, and you have to work them out under the chart to explain what happened according to each link for that emotional condition. The big lesson, the lesson here is to convince the person by working with these charts, and they tell me it works pretty well, um, to get some clarity. There's a difference between a pleasant, painful, and neutral feeling and the feeling of happiness or sadness or depression. All the, when you wanna know what the emotions are, they all have names. But feeling by itself is what happens initially in contact. Emotions do not um, formulate until after feeling happens first and then it jumps in as an emotion and starts to grow come like a, like a bulb, like a, a bud that starts going like this in craving and then goes like that and opens up in uh, clinging and then um, starts to fade as you start to deal with it. <coughs> okay, and then uh, you give me a, uh, uh, details of what you will be doing on Wednesday. So there I can give an uh, announcement. Yeah. Yeah. There is something I wanted to do tonight, just one second, that I thought was really nice. And David did it, and I thought we can do this. There's no reason why we can't. Um, wait a second. Jeez, I didn't think it was so far away. Um, wait a second, maybe I can find it this way. Oh, it's okay. I'm going to do it next time. I can't find it. I'm not good tonight. Okay, here we go. Ready? I thought I could put the closing prayer up, but it's not that simple. I don't know where I put it. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Okay, here we go. May suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. The sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.